In rail transport, track gauge or track gauge is the spacing of the rails on a railway track and is measured between the inner faces of the load-bearing rails. All vehicles on a rail network must have running gear that is compatible with the track gauge, and in the earliest days of railways the selection of a proposed railways gauge was a key issue. As the dominant parameter determining interoperability, it is still frequently used as a descriptor of a route or network. In some places there is a distinction between the nominal gauge and the actual gauge, due to divergence of track components from the nominal. Railway engineers use a device, like a caliper, to measure the actual gauge, and this device is also referred to as a track gauge. The terms structure gauge and loading gauge, both widely used, have little connection with track gauge. Both refer to two-dimensional cross-section profiles, surrounding the track and vehicles running on it. The structure gauge specifies the outline into which new or altered structures bridges, lineside equipment etc. must not encroach. The loading gauge is the corresponding envelope within which rail vehicles and their loads must be contained. If an exceptional load or a new type of vehicle is being assessed to run, it is required to conform to the route's loading gauge. Conformance ensures that traffic will not collide with lineside structures. Topic. Selection of gauge Topic. Early track gauges The earliest form of railway was a wooden wagonway, along which single wagons were manhandled, almost always in or from a mine or quarry. Initially the wagons were guided by human muscle power, subsequently by various mechanical methods. Timber rails wore rapidly, later, flat cast iron plates were provided to limit the wear. In some localities, the plates were made L-shaped, with the vertical part of the L guiding the wheels, this is generally referred to as a plateway. Flanged wheels eventually became universal, and the spacing between the rails had to be compatible with that of the wagon wheels. As the guidance of the wagons was improved, short strings of wagons could be connected and pulled by horses, and the track could be extended from the immediate vicinity of the mine or quarry, typically to a navigable waterway. The wagons were built to a consistent pattern, and the track would be made to suit the wagons. The gauge was more critical. The Pennydaran Tramroad of 1802 in South Wales, a plateway, spaced these at 4 feet 4 in 1,321 mm over the outside of the upstands. The Pennydaran Tramroad probably carried the first journey by a locomotive, in 1804, and it was successful for the locomotive, but unsuccessful for the track, the plates were not strong enough to carry its weight. A considerable progressive step was made when cast iron edge rails were first employed, these had the major axis of the rail section configured vertically, giving a much stronger section to resist bending forces, and this was further improved when fish belly rails were introduced. Edge rails required a close match between rail spacing and the configuration of the wheelsets, and the importance of the gauge was reinforced. Railways were still seen as local concerns, there was no appreciation of a future connection to other lines, and selection of the track gauge was still a pragmatic decision based on local requirements and prejudices, and probably determined by existing local designs of road vehicles. Thus, the Monkland and Kirkintillic Railway 1826 in the west of Scotland used 4 feet 6 in 1,372 mm, the Dundee and Newtile Railway 1831 in the northeast of Scotland adopted 4 feet 6 and a half in 1,384 mm, the Redruth and Chasewater Railway 1825 in Cornwall chose 4 feet 1,219 mm. The Arbroath and Forfar Railway opened in 1838 with a gauge of 5 feet 6 in 1,676 mm, and the Ulster Railway of 1839 used 6 feet 2 in 1,880 mm. 
Topic: <laughs> Standard gauge appears. Locomotives were being developed in the first decades of the 19th century, they took various forms, but George Stevenson developed a successful locomotive on the Killingworth Wagonway, where he worked. His designs were so successful that they became the standard, and when the Stockton and Darlington Railway was opened in 1825, it used his locomotives, with the same gauge as the Killingworth line, 4 feet 8 in 1422 mm. The Stockton and Darlington line was immensely successful, and when the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, the first intercity line, was built it opened in 1830, it used the same gauge. It was also hugely successful, and the gauge now eased to 4 feet 8 and a half in or 1,435 mm, became the automatic choice. Standard gauge <laughs> Gauge differences The Liverpool and Manchester was quickly followed by other trunk railways, with the Grand Junction Railway and the London and Birmingham Railway forming a huge critical mass of standard gauge. When Bristol promoters planned a line from London, they employed the innovative engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel. He decided on a wider gauge, to give greater stability, and the Great Western Railway adopted a gauge of 7 feet 2,134 mm, later eased to 7 feet 1 quarter in 2,140 mm. This became known as broad gauge. The Great Western Railway GWR was successful and was greatly expanded, directly and through friendly associated companies, widening the scope of broad gauge. At the same time, other parts of Britain built railways to standard gauge, and British technology was exported to European countries and parts of North America, also using standard gauge. Britain polarised into two areas, those that used broad gauge and those that used standard gauge. In this context, standard gauge was referred to as narrow gauge to indicate the contrast. Some smaller concerns selected other non-standard gauges. The Eastern Counties Railway adopted 5 feet 1524 mm. Most of them converted to standard gauge at an early date, but the GWR's broad gauge continued to grow. The larger railway companies wished to expand geographically, and large areas were considered to be under their control. When a new independent line was proposed to open up an unconnected area, the gauge was crucial in determining the allegiance that the line would adopt. If it was broad gauge, it must be friendly to the Great Western Railway. If narrow standard gauge, it must favor the other companies. The battle to persuade or coerce that choice became very intense, and became referred to as the gauge wars. As passenger and freight transport between the two areas became increasingly important, the difficulty of moving from one gauge to the other, the break of gauge, became more prominent and more objectionable. In 1845 a Royal Commission on Railway Gauges was created to look into the growing problem, and this led to the regulating the Gauge of Railways Act 1846, which forbade the construction of broad gauge lines unconnected with the broad gauge network. The broad gauge network was eventually converted. A progressive process completed in 1892, called gauge conversion. The same act mandated the gauge of 5 feet 3 in 1,600 mm for use in Ireland. <inaudible> <inaudible> gauge selection in other countries As railways were built in other countries, the gauge selection was pragmatic, the track would have to fit the rolling stock. If locomotives were imported from elsewhere, especially in the early days, the track would be built to fit them. In some cases standard gauge was adopted, but many countries or companies chose a different gauge as their national gauge, either by governmental policy, or as a matter of individual choice. <laughs> 
Government officials in Spain were concerned that the rail lines they were planning could be used by an invader, and purposely chose gauges that were different from their neighbors. Narrow gauges were widely used in mountainous regions, as construction costs tended to be lower and they enabled the tighter turns that were often required. Topic. Couplers To keep the rail traffic compatible within a network, not only the track gauge needs to be the same, but also the couplers, at least for locomotive hauled vehicles. For this reason, most of the standard gauge railways in Europe use the standard buffers and chain coupler with some use of the Buckeye coupler in the UK, for locomotive hauled vehicles, and some use Scharfenberg couplers on suburban multiple unit as well as variants of the SA3 couplers on some rolling stock, while narrow gauge railways use a variation of couplers, since they often are isolated from each other, so standardization is not needed. Similarly, standard gauge railways in Canada, the US and Mexico use the JANI coupler or the compatible tightlock coupling for locomotive hauled equipment. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Terminology. The terms standard gauge, broad gauge and narrow gauge do not have any fixed meaning. A standard Gauge is only standard in a geographical region where it is dominant, but it is generally understood to be 1,435 mm 4 feet 8 and a half in. An infrastructure owner would be ill-advised to order track materials simply as standard gauge, but would normally specify the required critical dimensions of the components. Broad gauge and narrow gauge are relative to the generally adopted standard. In British practice, the space between the rails of a track is colloquially referred to as the four foot, and the space between two tracks the six foot descriptions relating to the respective dimensions. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Standard gauge. In common usage, the term standard gauge refers to 1435 mm 4 feet 8 and a half in topic broad gauge in modern usage broad gauge generally refers to track spaced significantly wider than 1435 mm 4 feet 8 and a half in Medium gauge The term medium gauge had different meanings throughout history, depending on the local dominant gauge in use. In Australia, 3 feet 6 in 1067 mm and 3 feet 914 mm gauge railways are classified as medium gauge in order to make a distinction with standard gauge and the narrow gauges such as the widely used 2 feet 610 mm gauge sugar cane railways. In 1847, the 1,600 mm 5 feet 3 in Irish gauge was considered a medium gauge compared to Brunel's 7 feet 1 quarter in 2,140 mm broad gauge and the 1,435 mm 4 feet 8 and a half in narrow gauge, nowadays being standard gauge. In North America, medium gauge was 5 feet 6 in 1,676 mm track gauge, also called provincial gauge in Canada. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Narrow gauge. During the period known as the Battle of the Gauges, Stevenson's standard gauge was commonly known as narrow gauge while brunel's railways 7 feet 1 quarter in 2140 mm gauge was termed broad gauge <laughs> 
As the gauge of a railway is reduced the costs of construction can be reduced since narrow gauges allow smaller radius curves, allowing obstacles to be avoided rather than having to be built over or through valleys and hills. The reduced cost is particularly noticeable in mountainous regions, and many narrow gauge railways were built in Wales, the Rocky Mountains of North America, Central Europe and South America. Industrial railways are often narrow gauge. Sugar cane and banana plantations are often served by narrow gauges such as 2 feet 610 mm, as there is little through traffic to other systems. 500 mm feet gauge was also used in French mines. The most widely used narrow gauges on public railways are 1067 mm 3 feet 6 in southern and central Africa, Indonesia, Japan, Taiwan, Philippines, parts of Australia, New Zealand, Honduras and Costa Rica. 1000 mm 3 feet 3 and 3 eighths in meter gauge East Africa, South America and Central Europe. Topic: Minimum gauge Very narrow gauges of 2 feet 610 mm and under were used for some industrial railways in space-restricted environments such as mines or farms. The French company Dicavel developed 500 mm 19 and, 3 quarters in and 400 mm 15 and 3 quarters in tracks, mainly for mines. Haywood developed 15 in 381 mm gauge for estate railways. The most common minimum gauges were 15 in 381 mm, 400 mm, 15 and 3 quarters in, 16 in, 406 mm, 18 in, 457 mm, 500 mm, 19 and 3 quarters in, or 20 in, 508 mm. Topic: Break of gauge. Through operation between railway networks with different gauges was originally impossible, goods had to be transshipped and passengers had to change trains. This was obviously a major obstacle to convenient transport, and in Great Britain, led to political intervention. On narrow gauge lines, roll box or transporter wagons are used, standard gauge wagons are carried on narrow gauge lines on these special vehicles, generally with rails of the wider gauge to enable those vehicles to roll on and off at transfer points. On the Transmongolian Railway, Russia and Mongolia use 1,520 mm 4 feet 11 and 27 30 seconds in while China uses the standard gauge of 1,435 mm. At the border, each carriage is lifted and its bogies are changed. The operation can take several hours for a whole train of many carriages. Other examples include crossings into or out of the former Soviet Union, Ukraine, Slovakia border on the Bratislava Lviv train, and the Romania Moldova border on the Chisinau Bucharest train, a system developed by Talgo and Construcciones y Auxiliaire de Ferrocarriles CAF of Spain uses variable gauge wheelsets. At the border between France and Spain, through passenger trains are drawn slowly through apparatus that alters the gauge of the wheel wheels, which slide laterally on the axles. This is fully described in automatic gauge changeover for trains in Spain. A similar system is used between China and Central Asia, and between Poland and Ukraine, using the SUW2000 and INTERGAUGE variable axle systems. China and Poland use standard gauge, while Central Asia and Ukraine use 1,520 mm 4 feet 11 and 27 30 seconds in. <laughs> <laughs> Dual gauge Where a railway corridor is used by trains of two gauges, mixed gauge or dual gauge track can be provided, in which three rails are supported in the same track structure. 
This arose particularly when individual railway companies chose different gauges and were subsequently required to share a route. This is most commonly found at the approaches to city terminals, where land space is limited. Trains of different gauges sharing the same track can save considerable expense compared to using separate tracks for each gauge, but introduces complexities in track maintenance and signaling, and may require speed restrictions for some trains. If the difference between the two gauges is large enough, for example between 1,435 mm 4 feet 8 and a half in standard gauge and 3 feet 6 in 1,067 mm, 3 rail dual gauge is possible, but if not, for example between 3 feet 6 in 1,067 mm and 1,000 mm 3 feet 3 and 3 eighths in meter gauge, 4 rail triple gauge is used. Dual gauge rail lines are used in Switzerland, Australia, Argentina, Brazil, Japan, North Korea, Spain, Tunisia and Vietnam. On the GWR, there was an extended period between political intervention in 1846 that prevented major expansion of its 7 feet 1 quarter in 2140 mm broad gauge and the final gauge conversion to standard gauge in 1892. During this period, there were many locations where practicality required mixed gauge operation, and in station areas, the track configuration was extremely complex. This was compounded by the fact that the common rail had to be at the platform side in stations, so in many cases, standard gauge trains needed to be switched from one side of the track to the other at the approach. A special fixed point arrangement was devised for the purpose, where the track layout was simple enough. Jenkins and Langley give an illustration and description. In some cases, mixed gauge trains operated, conveying wagons of both gauges. For example, McDermott says, in November 1871 a novelty in the shape of a mixed gauge goods train was introduced between Truro and Penzance. It was worked by a narrow gauge engine, and behind the narrow gauge trucks came a broad gauge match truck with wide buffers and sliding shackles, followed by the broad gauge trucks. Such trains continued to run in West Cornwall until the abolition of the broad gauge, they had to stop or come down to walking pace at all stations where fixed points existed and the narrow portion side stepped to right or left. Topic. Nominal track gauge The nominal track gauge is the distance between the inner faces of the rails. In current practice, it is specified at a certain distance below the rail head as the inner faces of the rail head the gauge faces are not necessarily vertical. Rolling stock on the network must have running gear wheel sets that are compatible with the gauge, and therefore the gauge is a key parameter in determining interoperability, but there are many others, see below. In some cases in the earliest days of railways, the railway company saw itself as an infrastructure provider only, and independent holiers provided wagons suited to the gauge. Colloquially the wagons might be referred to as four foot gauge wagons say if the track had a gauge of four feet this nominal value does not equate to the flange spacing as some freedom is allowed for an infrastructure manager might specify new or replacement track components at a slight variation from the nominal gauge for pragmatic reasons topic units The gauge is defined in old imperial units or in universally accepted metric units or SI units. Imperial units were established in the United Kingdom by the Weights and Measures Act of 1824. The United States customary units for length did not agree with the imperial system until 1959, when one international yard was defined as 0.9144 meters, i.e. one foot as 0.3048 meter and one inch as 25.4 millimeters. <laughs> 
The list shows the imperial and other units that have been used for track gauge definitions. Topic: <laughs> Temporary way, permanent way. The temporary way is the temporary track often used for construction, replaced by the permanent way the structure consisting of the rails, fasteners, sleepers, ties and ballast or slab track plus the underlying subgrade when construction nears completion. In many cases narrow gauge track is used for a temporary way because of the convenience in laying it and changing its location over unimproved ground. In restricted spaces such as tunnels, the temporary way might be double track even though the tunnel will ultimately be single track. The airport rail link in Sydney had construction trains of 900 mm 2 feet 11 and 7 sixteenths in gauge, which were replaced by permanent tracks of 1,435 mm 4 feet 8 and a half in gauge. During World War I trench warfare led to a relatively static disposition of infantry, requiring considerable logistics to bring them support staff and supplies food, ammunition, earthworks materials, etc. Dense light railway networks using temporary narrow gauge track sections were established by both sides for this purpose. In 1939, it was proposed to construct the western section of the Yunnan Burma Railway using a gauge of 15 and a quarter in 387 mm, since such tiny or toy gauge facilitates the tightest of curves in difficult terrain. Topic. Maintenance standards Infrastructure owners specify permitted variances from the nominal gauge, and the required interventions when non-compliant gauge is detected. For example, the Federal Railroad Administration in the USA specifies that the actual gauge of a 1,435 mm track that is rated for a maximum of 60 miles per hour (96.6 kilometers per hour) must be between 4 feet 8 in (1,422 mm) and 4 feet 9.5 in (1,460 mm). Topic. Advantages and disadvantages of different track gauges When selecting a gauge, there is a trade-off between different pros and cons. Narrow gauge, pros, lower cost, less demanding right-of-way and construction. Cons, lower speed, less stability, less load carrying capacity Broad gauge, pros, higher speed, stability and capacity. Cons, higher cost, more demanding right of way and construction One generally wants speed, stability, capacity, and one wants economy, but there is often an inverse relationship between these priorities. In addition, there are other constraints, such as the load carrying capacity of axles, which may be problematic with an excessively wide gauge. There is a common misconception that a narrower gauge permits a tighter turning radius, but for practical purposes, there is no meaningful relationship between gauge and curvature. Narrow gauge railways usually cost less to build because they are usually lighter in construction, using smaller cars and locomotives, smaller loading gauge, as well as smaller bridges, smaller tunnels, smaller structure gauge, and tighter curves. Narrow gauge is thus often used in mountainous terrain, where the savings in civil engineering work can be substantial. It is also used in sparsely populated areas, with low potential demand, and for temporary railways that will be removed after short term use, such as for construction, the logging industry, the mining industry, or large scale construction projects, especially in confined spaces. See temporary way, permanent way. Broader gauge railways are generally more expensive to build, but offer higher speed, stability, and capacity. For routes with high traffic, greater capacity may more than offset the higher initial cost of construction. There is no single perfect gauge, because different environments and economic considerations come into play, 
a narrow gauge is better suited for difficult terrain and or routes with low traffic. Conversely, wide gauge is preferable for direct, unimpeded routes with high traffic. The standard gauge is intended to strike a reasonable balance between these factors. This may also be true of the 1,372 mm (4 feet 6 in) and the Russian gauge. In addition to the general trade-off, another important factor is standardization. Once a standard has been chosen, and equipment, infrastructure, and training calibrated to that standard, conversion becomes difficult and expensive. This also makes it easier to adopt an existing standard than to invent a new one. This is true of many technologies, including railroad gauges. For rail gauge in particular, break of gauge often causes inefficiency far in excess of the merits of any particular gauge. The reduced cost, greater efficiency, and greater economic opportunity offered by the use of a common standard explains why a small number of gauges predominate worldwide. <laughs> Dominant gauges Approximately 55% of the world's railways use the 1,435 mm 4 feet 8 and a half in standard gauge. Total for each type of gauge. Topic: <laughs> Future. Further convergence of rail gauge use seems likely, as countries seek to build interoperable networks, and international organizations seek to build macro-regional and continental networks. The European Union has set out to develop interoperable freight and passenger rail networks across its area, and is seeking to standardize gauge, signaling and electrical power systems. As countries build high-speed rails, they also tend to converge these rails gauge to standard gauge, with the exceptions of Uzbekistan and Russia. Europe EU funds have been dedicated to assist Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia in the building of some key railway lines Rail Baltica of standard gauge, and to assist Spain and Portugal in the construction of high-speed lines to connect Iberian cities to one another and to the French high-speed lines. The EU has developed plans for improved freight rail links between Spain, Portugal, and the rest of Europe. Topic. Trans-Asian Railway The United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific UNESCAP is planning a trans-Asian railway that will link Europe and the Pacific, with a northern corridor from Europe to the Korean Peninsula, a southern corridor from Europe to Southeast Asia, and a north-south corridor from Northern Europe to the Persian Gulf. All these would encounter breaks of gauge as they cross Asia. Current plans have mechanized facilities at the breaks of gauge to move containers from train to train rather than widespread gauge conversion. The Americas 2008 – Proposed link between Venezuela and Colombia 2008 – Venezuela via Brazil to Argentina, standard gauge 2008 – A proposed meter gauge line across southern Paraguay to link Argentina at Resistencia to Brazil at Cascavel, both those lines are 1,000 mm 3 feet 3 and 3 eighths in meter gauge, and the new line would allow bioceanic running from the Atlantic port of Paranagua in Brazil to that of Antofagasta in Chile on the Pacific. Topic. Africa The East African Railway Master Plan is a proposal for rebuilding and expanding railway lines connecting Ethiopia, Djibouti, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, South Sudan and beyond. 
The plan is managed by infrastructure ministers from participating East African community countries in association with transport consultation firm CPCS Transcom. Older railways are of 1,000 mm 3 feet 3 and 3 eighths in meter gauge or 3 feet 6 in 1,067 mm gauge. Newly rebuilt lines will use standard gauge. The standard gauge Addis Ababa Djibouti and Mombasa Nairobi railways were scheduled to begin regular freight and passenger services in 2017. Lines for iron ore to Kribi in Cameroon are likely to be 1,435 mm 4 feet 8 and a half in standard gauge with a likely connection to the same port from the 1,000 mm 3 feet 3 and 3 eighths in meter gauge Cameroon system. This line owned by Sundance Resources may be shared with Legend Mining. Nigeria's railways are mostly 3 feet 6 in 1,067 mm Cape Gauge. The Lagos-Kano Standard Gauge Railway is a gauge conversion project by the Nigerian government to create a north-south standard gauge rail link. The first converted segment, between Abuja and Kaduna, was completed in July 2016. Topic. Australia Lines for iron ore to Okaji Port in Western Australia are proposed to form a combined dual-gauge network. Topic timeline 4 feet 8 and a half in 1435 mm 1825 chosen by George Stevenson 5 feet 1524 mm 1827 chosen by Horatio Allen for the South Carolina Canal and Railroad Company 1 foot 11 and a half in 597 mm 1836 chosen by Henry Archer for the Festiniog Railway to easily navigate mountainous terrain started Britain's first narrow gauge passenger service in 1865 originally horse drawn 7 feet 1 quarter in 2140 mm 1838 chosen by IK Brunel 5 feet 1524 mm 1842 chosen by George Washington Whistler for the Moscow St Petersburg railway based on southern US practice 5 feet 3 in 1600 Mm, 1846 chosen in Ireland as a compromise 5 feet 6 in 1676 mm 1853 chosen by Lord Dalhousie in India following Scottish practice 3 feet 6 in 1067 mm 1862 chosen by Carl Pill for the Roros line in Norway to reduce costs 3 feet 6 in 1067 mm 1865 Chosen by Abraham Fitzgibbon for the Queensland Railways to reduce costs 3 feet 914 mm 1870 Chosen by William Jackson Palmer for the Denver and Rio Grande Railway to reduce costs inspired by the Festiniog Railway 2 feet 610 mm 1877 Chosen by George E. Mansfield for the Billerica and Bedford Railroad to reduce costs inspired by the Festiniog Railway. 2 feet 6 in 762 mm 1887 chosen by Everard Calthrop to reduce costs, had designs for a matching fleet of rolling stock. See also <laughs> <laughs> Notes <laughs>